Well, good evening. It's great to see all of you. Merry Christmas. Yeah, fellas, Walgreens, uh, they're open to 12. I just looked it up for you guys, so you can still get there. Uh, so we're going to look at, uh, obviously we're going to look at Christmas, um, but uh, there's a lot of things that you could say uh, about God through Christmas, but I want to I wanna emphasize what I believe is the highest priority for us, because I think we need to hear this. I think uh, we're, we're all in, in different places, but I, I think um, we need to hear a word from the Lord that's appropriate for this season and appropriate for this context. And I want to start with a, just a very famous uh, verse from the, from the book of Ecclesiastes. And it's this, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Right? A time to be born, a time to reign. That's it, right? Um, it's the birds, right? That's good, okay, all right. Uh, there's, it's appropriate for this season to have a particular message for us um, because uh, some of you might be walking into a church thinking, you know what, I feel every single time I walk into a church is this, God wants to work on me. That there is some weakness that you have that God wants to deal with, that he wants to improve you or enhance you in some way. So that's what you're thinking. Okay, I'm coming in here, and, I'm, and I know this is what God wants to do. He obviously wants to fix some part of me. Some of you walk in here, and every single time you walk into a church, you think that. I'm a project for God. And well, of course, right? Of course that is true in the sense that God works on us. You look at the story of Job, where Satan said to, uh, or God said to Satan, okay, you can do whatever you want with my man Job. Take away his whole entire life, if you will. You just can't kill him. But he will be faithful, and God worked on Job, and we see what God did and how he shows us perseverance. We see what he did through working on the person that was Saul in the New Testament that became Paul. Changed his life. God worked on him. Maybe you think, you know, there's been seasons in your life where God is working on you. There's this addiction, and you know that God has brought me to church to work on me. Um, we see it with the person of Peter in, in the Bible. God is working on me. But let me just tell you this. The Christmas season uh, is not about God working on you. In other words, I want you to think for the next 24, 48, 72 hours, that is not what God's doing to you. He has not come to work on you. Some, that's a good thing for God to do, but I don't want you to focus on that. Some of you come in here and think, okay, you know what? I need to know what God's calling is in my life. In other words, what's God's will for my life? We see this through um, uh, the, the story of Samuel or, or Moses, where Moses was away and then the burning bush comes and God calls him, right, to be the leader of the Israelites. We see uh, God calling, right, God calling the Israelites back to himself through, we just read Isaiah, right, uh, through Isaiah, through Jeremiah, through Ezekiel, through these major prophets and minor prophets. Um, and we also see the story of Jonah, God calling God. Maybe you feel like God is calling you and you want God to talk to you during this season. But I'm, what I want to say is this. The Christmas season is not about God calling on you. It's not. So if you come in here and you think, well, God's going to work on me. God's going to do something. No, this is not the primary emphasis of Christmas. The primary emphasis of Christmas is not God calling you to something. Maybe you think that it's not. Of course that's what God's going to do in his time, in his season. Because to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under, under the heaven. But what do we see? I mean, what, I mean, if we need to emphasize something for the next 24, 48, 72 hours, if you need to talk about something, if you want to emphasize a certain part of theology about God, I, I want to bring us right smack dab to John 1, 1, 14. This is the point. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That the word, literally, the word, Logos, God, Jesus, became what? Put flesh on and made his what? His, he made his presence with you. This is not about God working on you. And this is not about God calling you to something or you getting some revelation for God's will. This, unbelievably, is about the presence of God. And here's, what we, here's what's, what's amazing. It's not about a tabernacle, even though that's what that word dwelling, that actually you could, you could um, replace that with and made his, he tabernacled among us. 
or his temple or the Torah, right? The three ways in which you knew the presence of God or the words of God. He is saying to you and to me that the Christmas season is what? The Christmas season is truly about, uh, let's go to the next slide, make, making what? His dwelling with you. Can you take that? Now some of you, uh, just so you know, this, uh, they said on the order of worship, it was a sermon, but then we moved it down to a message, and actually it was moved all the way down to a reflection, right? That's, that's good for you guys, right? That means time's less, a lot less time, right? If you go from a sermon to a message to a reflection, that's good stuff, right? That's Christmas Eve style, right? It's a good, good day in all ways, right? What if you didn't focus on God working on some weakness, God calling you or you, you wanting to know his will, but what if you just focused on that God was with you? That's it. God is with you. Now, how do you think, because I want this to be practical for you. How do you think this could help us? Because I think there are two major uh, struggles that I, I'm experiencing, and I think we, probably all of us at some level, and that is fear, right? I mean, this pandemic has changed our lives in so many different ways. We, we feel, uh, we, you know, un, things that are unknown, our future is unknown. We feel, we experience fear and anger. Many of us are either in one of those two camps, or maybe you vacillate between the two. You're either mad or you are angry. And you know what? It's, it's moved from unhealthy fear, or f- f- healthy fear to unhealthy fear. And you're living in that, and fear is winning. Or you just become angry and mad. So what in the world does Emmanuel, God with us, have to do with either one of those right, struggles? Well, I, I think you look at the Bible, and you say, okay, if we're gonna talk about God, and God is called a bunch of different things, how, what, what perspective or description of God would be helpful, and let's just put it, start with fear. I want to read this one verse, Galatians 4, 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you're a son, then you're an heir through God. What is that saying? What it's saying is that I want you to see the presence of God as a what? As a loving father. And I want you to see this in the context of fear. Fear. That when you feel fearful or or pain or suffering in some way, that God, you could see and view God's presence as a father to be healing for you or to overwhelm the, 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 the fear or the pain, right? So about three years ago, I was at Ed Radish here, the, the ball fields, and I was watching my son play soccer, and it was a cold, it was like, I think it was January or early February. I mean, it was freezing. I mean, we're talking like the low 60s, you know. You just start freaking out if you're one of us. We're wearing all kinds of coats and whatnot. But this one dad had on a, a particularly oversized jacket. And he was sitting kind of close, and I was, you know, we were just all watching the game, and his son was playing. And then, as you see, his son kind of got colder and colder and got closer to his dad, and he started saying, Dad, I'm cold. Dad, I'm cold. And so the son moved closer to his father and then he kept saying he was cold and his dad put his arm around him, right? And, he was, and then he still turned to him and he said, Dad, I'm still cold. And one of the coolest things I'd seen in a while, his dad says, okay, you know, kind of exasperated. He unzips his jacket. He goes, it's pal, right here. And he then puts his coat on and zips it back up, right? <laughs> and so there is a dad, right? And his son is inside his jacket. And if you think about that, for what, what was happening there was, was what? Is that, and he didn't complain about it anymore. It wasn't like it wasn't cold or he didn't deal with cold anymore, but what was happening? The warmth overwhelmed the coldness, right? That's what God offers us through his presence as, his fa- as our father. He's saying to you, look, can you trust me as a dad? And says, who, he says to you, I am God with us. I am God with you. I have come to be with you. There's no other religion in the entire world that has the God, the sovereign God, that comes in the form of a man, and even more than that, in the form of a baby, to grow into a man to love us. I mean, that's how, and and then he's described as this father, and some of us are living in fear. 
And that's all we think of. And we, fear has morphed into paranoia or obsessive compulsive. Kind of, we're nervous and neurotic about all kinds of things. I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned, but the scriptures, Christmas offers us, right, a, a, a truth, a love, a presence of God that overwhelms the coldness, that overwhelms the fear. Are you experiencing that? Do you believe that's truly available to you? And I want to say one of the gifts that maybe you could unwrap is the gift of, right, the strength and the warmth of a loving father. That that, if you're not, if you're not a slave, because you, when you walk in here and you know Christ, you're not a slave, you're a son. You get a seat at the table. You have a room in the mansion. And not just that, you are going to be the heir. You're going to receive all the rights and privileges of that. That is a loving father. The Christmas season is about God dwelling with you. What if you could sit in that and not, and just for a few days here, stop thinking that God is working on me or God is calling me to something. Because you, what you need to sit and kind of just simmer in right now, God is with you. His jacket is around you. He zipped it up and you are close to him. And that warmth is bigger and greater than the fear or the coldness outside. Anger. I told you this is going to be quick. John 15, 15 says this. Once again, you are no longer a slave. You're no longer a servant because a slave or a servant does not know his master's business. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples. Instead, here's what I've called you, Westtown. <clears throat> I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Do you believe that the God of the universe calls you a friend? It's a weird way to think about God. But this is what he's trying to tell his disciples. You need to view God at times as your father. But hey, you also need to view him as your friend. Now you tell me, when you're really mad, when you really need to dump your bucket, and you feel you need to blow off some steam, where do you go? I know where I can go. To my closest friends, right? I call them. Hey, we need to get a beer. We need to go get a coffee. We need to go out to eat. I got I to gotta talk to you about some things. And what happens? You sit there for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, and you just let it fly. And what does a good friend do? Listens. He doesn't judge. He listens. He empathizes with you. Like, oh, man, that's kind of, And so, yeah, you're thinking this. So that's why that hurt. Yeah. And then he did this. Oh, man. Wow. And what happens in those moments when a good friend hears you well? And that anger begins to dissipate. And you get caught up in, man, oh, there's just fellowship and a guy understands me. And you know what happens? Is the empathy and the care and the love overwhelm the anger. And some of us in this room are just mad. You are just mad. And God wants to say, no, you don't have to. Of course you can be concerned. Of course you can be troubled by things, but you don't have to live in anger. You have what? You have a friend in what? Emmanuel, God came to be with us. Talk to him as your friend. Experience him as your father, but talk to him as a friend. What if that was the second gift that you got? And you know what? The fear and the anger in your family room, right, begins to subside. And then Christmas morning, we can, hey, we can kind of depressurize the situation and literally experience Christmas as it was offered to you. Because if fear drops, if anger drops, then what? The presence of, the God, uh, presence of God gets bigger in your family room, right? In your bedroom, in your kitchen, in all the rooms of your house. Because that's what God's presence is about. The whole earth is supposed to be filled with his glory, with his presence. So how do we do that? We have to take perspectives and say, okay, God, how can you, how do I look at you through Christmas time, because some of you, if you think God's just working on you, you're not going to be able to experience the warmth of a father. If you think that God's just calling you to something all the time, you're not going to be able to view Jesus as your friend. Take 72 hours right now and say, you know what Christmas is about? God came not to fix me or improve me, but simply to be with me. What if you talked about that tonight? God came to be with me us. Whoa. Not to change me right now. Of course, God's going to work on me. Of course, God's going to call me to things. But for these few days, let's as a family think God just wants to be with us. And what happens? Shoulders drop, right? 
and we exhale and we get to experience what God, uh, what God meant when he sent his son. Let me pray and ask God to work. Father.